Tonight's topic, of course, is Pacific Northwest up in smoke, wildfires, forests, and climate change. for drinking, and if there's any audio, it's usually an accordion. So, this is why I came to United States. It's the only country where they have science in breweries. Yeah. Could, could you advance, please, next slide? And by the way, no more beautiful slides. Heidi's slide was the most beautiful slide that had my name on it. And can I please have a copy of that? Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about today, and if I run out of time, please look up the article that um, I published with Asim Prakash in The Hill on this very issue. Um, if you don't find it on The Hill, I am the only Nevis at UW, so there, there's going to be no challenges in finding um, my, my publications at the UW homepage. Just Google UW Nevis, you'll find me. Anyway, so this was the article that, that Sean mentioned, Seattle Smoky Summers are becoming the new normal, and if that is indeed the case, what can we do about it? I'm a scientist, but I'm a social scientist. I study societies and how we respond to environmental issues like forest fires, climate change, and others. Next slide, please. Okay, those of you who are from Seattle, you're completely ignorant about this. You never had to worry about this. If you're from California, you know it very well, you get it with your mother's milk. What this is, is air quality index. What it tells you is that green's okay if it's yellow and you have asthma. I'm very sorry to hear that. You don't want to be outdoors if it's orange. You definitely don't want to be outdoors if you're 50 plus and so on. If it's red, look for a different country, okay? And we in Seattle, we're not used to seeing these numbers, but in August 21, I don't have a map, but I thought I'll give you a number. Actually, I do have a map. But first, sorry, let me just go back to the numbers. <laughs> Those are the numbers from end of August. They're all in red. They're over 180, uh, 170. That's not what we're used to in Seattle, okay? Air quality index in Seattle, we usually get 40, 25, um, not 170. My son woke up and exited the door and he said, <laughs> he smelled and he said, this smells like Delhi. Delhi, India, and he was absolutely right, because this is how Delhi smells in December when they're burning their rice paddies, okay? It's organic matter burning, and that's what we had in Seattle. Um, so those are the numbers where you don't want to um, be residing. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, a, a map we're not used to seeing, those red dots are really poor air quality index areas and we in the Pacific Northwest, we love the outdoors, we love the clean air, we're not used to red dots. So my question is, what are we going to do about those red dots? Next slide, please. Uh, I, know, I know you may think that it's not important, I know you may be fed up with the question of who done it, uh, but in public policy, we do have this question and we have to take it very seriously. So on the one hand, we had Secretary Zinke who, um, who claimed that what we were experiencing is because of bad forest management. On the other hand, we had Washington governor who's, who was attributing fires to climate change. And what we're doing is we're staying indoors with or without in-laws and saying we just want this to be resolved. We don't care who's done it. As a social scientist, I have to tell you we do care about who's done it because that question, um, in that question provides, um, so, uh, provides answer to two uh, important issues. One is if we know who's done it, then we know whose behavior has to change. And if they cannot change behavior, they at least need to pay for it. Okay? Because not everyone can change behavior, but we can, thank you. You, li you like the pain for it, right? <laughs> so, a natural scientist will probably not give you or me or us 
an answer where they would say, well, partial regression coefficient that explains the responsibility of climate versus the poor uh, fuel management is this. We're not going to get that. So the question is, without that information, what can we do? Next slide, please. What can we do about it in Washington? I know you, you must be wondering, what was she thinking when she put this up? You can obviously not read what's on the left side of the screen, but what it is is a part of the initiative 1631 that specifies that 25% of the revenue that would be generated if 1631 were to pass, the 25% of that revenue would go towards clean waters and healthy forests. So we've not decided yet who's done it, yet we're generating funds if 1631 were to pass. We would generate funds that would provide some funds to address the issues of healthy forests. So that's what's on the left, and you can obviously read in detail about 1631. On the right-hand side, just a reminder, we're already doing a lot about it. I have just picked up one agency, and that is the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. If you look at their wildfire information, you're going to see that they're working hard on industrial um, fire precaution levels. They're working hard on educating communities, working with communities to write plans that will help them adapt and adjust and respond when needed. They're providing information. They're setting up the information and alert systems. So we are working a lot on these issues in Washington State. The problem is not that many fires were from Washington State. So next slide, please. What do we do about fires in British Columbia, Oregon, and California? So my last slide here has three sections. The top section is what can governments, plural, do? What can environmental NGOs do? And we have many of them here today. They're all active on these issues. So if you would please give, help me and give them a hand, help, uh, thanking them for what you're doing. And I also want to point out that industry has to play a role, okay? So let me go through these points. First, governments. On the right-hand side, I have a slide. I did not create it, create it uh, but I did, I'm using a slide that's uh, from prob probably Department of Interior showing the ownership of forests on the West Coast. The dark green is national forests. The lighter green is state forests. What I'm trying to say is there's a lot of government-owned forests. And obviously there, the precautions are being, uh, the policies are being adopted, um, policies are changing. One more thing that I want to highlight is um, air pollution. We have in United States policies where we have addressed air pollution that's coming from one state to another state. In the east, on the uh, east coast, there is something what we call ozone transport region, where the air pollution is coming from the Midwest and moving to the Northeast. EPA has put in place and the Congress has put in place a system that allows those states to work one with another to develop systems for reducing the pollution that then crosses state boundaries. So in the United States, we've learned how to address these cross-state transboundary issues. We do have examples, we know how to do it. Of course, there's also challenges. The upwind states don't want to be a part of the region, um, and that issue is not being yet resolved. But we do have institutional precedent, if you want, to address cross-state transboundary pollution issues, air pollution issues. Um, another institutional issue that is beginning to be addressed is how do we pay for fire, for fire disasters. In the past, we were borrowing from Peter to paying Paul, essentially taking funds from regular management to pay for disaster. Um, what we need is a separate disaster funding, which we don't yet have for forests at the national level. Um, so that's another solution that we have to work on. Um, Another thing that we have to start talking about is cross-state cost sharing. 
Can we in Washington, if we're really upset about forests in Oregon, BC, and California, help them keep those fires down? Are we willing to pay? Are we willing to cost share and help them suppress those fires and control those fires? So those are the government side issues. Environmental NGO side issues. One issue that I'd like to point out as a social scientist is that we may have a conflict we will likely have to resolve a conflict when on one hand we will have the Endangered Species Act and protection of endangered species. On the other hand, we will have fire suppression. And we will have to have very serious conversations. Are we willing to give up maybe something on the Endangered Species Act um, to help with fire control and fire suppression? That's an open question. I'm not saying one way or the other, but it will be a question that will come up and we the society will have to answer it. Industry. Industry has worked carefully within itself and developed the best forest practices. Industry has worked with environmental NGOs and has developed even better forest practices. We can find, we can look for solutions in those same best practices. They already have standards for how to handle forest management. They already have standards on how to address fire in a forest. We can go back to those, we can modify those, industry can modify those, and we as consumers can reward the industry that's incorporating fires, uh, fire adaptation into more stringent forestry practices. Um, so this is my last slide, and I'm excited to hear questions from the audience. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much,